Recently, lots of stories from around the globe have broken about Twitter. Everything from falling stock prices to online censorship to police officers literally visiting a Dutch man's home because he needed to watch his tone. I've been keeping a fairly close watch on this issue, and I wanted to outline six points that I feel may spell the end for Twitter, or at least should. It was reported on Wednesday, February 10th, that the social media company had lost 2 million users in the last three months of 2015, and its shares plummeted as much as 12%. Twitter only had 305 million active users as of December 2015. Compare this to Facebook, which has 1.6 billion active users. And more embarrassing yet, even Facebook's photo sharing app Instagram surpassed Twitter in September, growing to 400 million users. Once mighty Twitter can't seem to keep up, despite new management and features, it hasn't done much to instill confidence in shareholders. In fact, fourth quarter earnings showed that Twitter's growth has completely stagnated, with a net loss of $90 million. So what exactly is it that's scaring both users and investors away? An inexplicable crackdown of right-wing supporters and political figures. The biggest of which was Breitbart columnist Milo Yiannopoulos, who had his verification stamp taken away in January, a stunt by Twitter insiders that kicked off a hashtag that trended globally, Just Sui Milo, and gained the controversial provocateur over 30,000 new followers. Others whose opinions are not in lockstep with Twitter's have also reported having their accounts suspended or deleted. The trend shows that these people all share similar political leanings. Anyone critical of Islam or feminism or vocal Trump supporters have been affected by sweeping actions taken by Twitter. I'm not right-wing, but I don't have to be to see that this is very problematic to free speech and open discourse online, especially since Twitter has become almost as essential a public outlet as the internet itself. Twitter is instituting a timeline algorithm a la Facebook that reorders tweets at the top of a user's timeline with tweets determined by criteria Twitter will prioritize. With this new timeline model, Twitter will show you what they think you should see and not necessarily what you want to see. It's a very corporate, advertising-friendly model, by the way. Wink, wink. Right now, the change is just opt-in, like Facebook's was. But it's likely Twitter will gradually turn it on for the entire user base just like Facebook did. When word got out, many users went into a meltdown, prompting use of the hashtag RIP Twitter to vent their fury about the rumored change. January 26th. Former Hillary Clinton advisor Peter Dow openly asked Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey in a tweet to censor the viral hashtag, words that don't describe Hillary, citing misogyny, a talking point which has been largely used in the name of feminism for silencing critics many of which come from the conservative corner of Twitter, again showing their bias against anyone who steps outside of the PC safe space. Ironically, at the same time that Twitter has been pressing the mute button on specific individuals for politically incorrect faux pas, they've been allowing ISIS to use their platform as a recruitment tool to promote their brand of extremism. Now, Twitter did announce that they were being more aggressive in shutting down ISIS accounts, but... Doesn't this all seem somewhat curious that ISIS, a terrorist organization which has been tied to Saudi Arabia, and Hillary Clinton, who also has close ties to Saudi Arabia, is getting preferential treatment from Twitter? Hmm. Until you discover, Saudi Prince Al Walid bin Talal is the second largest shareholder of Twitter stock. Now, I think it's common knowledge that the country of Saudi Arabia is hardly known for its exemplary record on human rights particularly free speech. This is a country where women are second class to men, and bloggers have been publicly lashed for wrong think. If you disagree with the government there, if you question the official state religion, they will imprison or execute you. After a lengthy torture, of course. And now, the second biggest shareholder of Twitter stock, a controlling share, is a prince from that country. It all comes to a head in point one. Mr. Jack Dorsey, who is the co-founder and current CEO of Twitter, makes his ideological leanings well known on his personal Twitter account. So it's really no wonder that he has recruited such a diverse group to head his trust and safety council. All the choices you could want from the authoritarian left to the far authoritarian left. Most notably, controversial feminist and gaming critic Anita Sarkeesian. The same woman who visited the UN last year to have the entire internet censored. 
Putting Anita Sarkeesian in charge of your Trust and Safety Council makes about as much sense as the UN putting Saudi Arabia in charge of their Human Rights Council. Which they actually did. And it comes as no surprise that many of those from the far left who espouse radical feminist ideology also share a space with those who want to shut down criticism of Islam as hate speech. And there you have it. A toxic cocktail of politics and business converging to threaten free expression online. Jack Dorsey has even went so far as to say that freedom of expression starts with safety. With safety. It doesn't get much more Orwellian 1984 Ministry of Truth than that. But this is exactly what Twitter has created with the Trust and Safety Council to manage their platform. To conclude, I must say, why should anyone be surprised by this? Twitter was never the people's platform. It was always commercial. So why should any of us be shocked when they make decisions to help their own interests? The last decade has shown us that social media can be useful, fun, thought-provoking, and powerful. But people have had enough of getting zucked around. It's time for something new. So what alternatives are out there? So far, there's projects like MeWe and Trist, which are 100% open and decentralized. What social media was meant to be. Not a tool for ideologues, governments, or employers to use against you. But will the masses choose to migrate to these open and free platforms, or apathetically yield to government-sponsored corporate thought control?